The first of these relatively unknown JavaScript features that are super useful that I want to look at is known as a proxy object. So here we have an object of a person with a first name and a last name. Then we have this handler object that we'll look at in a second, and we create a person proxy. So this is going to be a new proxy that takes in the original object and this handler. And what this does is it allows us to sort of overwrite the default behavior of the object in some way. So in this case, we're overwriting the ability to get and set a property. So we have a get and set function. The get is going to take in the target, which is the original object, as well as the property that's actually being gotten. So here we can see all we're doing is we're logging out, getting whatever the property is, and then that property value from the target. And then we return this call to reflect.get, which essentially says, go just call the original getter. And then we also have set. So set does something similar, but in this case, it logs out that we're setting the property. We're also going to take in whatever the new value is. And then we call the reflect.set method, which again is going to essentially just be the same thing as the native setter on the object. And then we can use the person proxy just like the original object. So we could do something like console.log person proxy dot first name and you'll see we log out getting first name is john and then we log out john so we log out john from here because the result of person proxy dot first name is john and then the getting first name john comes from here because we actually called this get handler and additionally if we set a value so if instead we said person proxy dot age is going to be let's say 30 now you'll see we have setting age is 30. And it's important to note that this person proxy is sort of a wrapper around the original person, but whatever we do to it does affect that original person. So for example, if I was to now do console.log our person.age, the original person now has this age of 30. However, you'll note that when I call person.age, it does not go into this getter because I'm calling person.age, not person.proxy.age. So we're not using the wrapper here, but if instead we did person.proxy.age, you'll see we get getting age is 30. So proxies can be useful in a variety of circumstances. They're actually used under the hood by a lot of different JavaScript frameworks, but also we tend to use them from time to time for things like if we have some object that we want to log to some analytics every time that we access something in that object. Next, I want to take a look at a feature of JavaScript classes that, again, is super useful, but I don't see being used all that much. It's starting to catch on more now, but it's still not super popular, and that's going to be private fields. So here we have a person class with a name and age and a constructor to set the name and age. And here we can see we have a variable named Connor, which is a new person with the name of Connor and the age of 26. And we can see if we log out Connor.name, we get Connor. However, what if we say we wanted to make age be private? Well, right now we can get the age and that's not what we want. We want age to be private so that it can only be accessed within the class. And the way we can do that is by simply putting a pound sign before the name of the variable. So instead of age, we now have this dot and then pound age. And that's actually going to make it private. So if I try to get Connor dot pound age, you'll see this is actually underlined in red because this is going to cause an error. So if we look at this, we can see syntax error, private field age must be declared in an enclosing class. So essentially this is saying we don't have access to this age. However, of course, our name we do still have access to because that is not private. Now, of course, there are ways that you can still make these private fields become accessible. So for example, you could have some getter. So we could say get age and all this is going to do is simply return this dot age. So essentially what we're doing here is creating a getter for a public age that is somehow different from this private age. You can see now if we come down here and do Connor.age, we get 26 because this getter function is actually public even though it's accessing something that is private. And this sort of pattern in a way works similar to the proxy objects because Maybe we don't necessarily need age to be completely private like we're doing here, but we just need to make sure we are logging out if we actually access it. So we could do something like console.log getting age. And now you'll see we still get 26, but we log out getting age. And if we try to go around it by doing console.log Connor dot 
age and doing the private version of the age. Now we just get that same error message again. Next, I'm going to look at something called a weak map and a weak set. So here we have a normal map. So we can see const map is new map. Then we have this function that represents some expensive computation. So something very slow. And because it's so slow, we are using this map as a way to sort of cache the results. So this expensive computation takes in some object. And first we see, have we already run this function with the same object before? And if we have, we're just going to return map.get of that object. But if we haven't, then we're going to set the object in our map. That way we have it for future calls. And the value is just going to be this object.data times two. And you could imagine this is something that's very slow. Of course, in this case, it's not but you could imagine we're doing something very expensive here. And then you can see down here, we have this object one and object two that we're using to call the function. Object one has data of 10 and object two has data of 20. And we log out expensive computation with object one and object two. And this gives us value 20 and value 40. But then down here, we set object one equal to null. And what this should do is say, okay, we're not actually using object one anymore. So we can just garbage collect it. We don't need object one to exist anymore. But that's actually not going to happen because object one is not able to be garbage collected because it still exists inside of our map. But this map was only being used for the purpose of caching results. And we're never going to call expensive computation with object one again, because that object doesn't even exist outside of the context of this map. So we don't need it to exist in the map anymore, and we just don't need it to exist anywhere. So essentially, this is sort of like a memory leak. But the solution to this is simply to change our map from a standard map to what's called a weak map. And this is going to work the same way. So you can see we still get value 20 and value 40. However, now this is actually going to allow object one to be eligible for that garbage collection. So we are telling the JavaScript engine, hey, whatever we put in this map, if it actually doesn't exist anywhere else anymore, just garbage collected. Don't worry about this map for the purpose of garbage collection. So that's really all there is to a weak map and a weak set works the same way. It is just a set except for the fact that if the values which are objects inside of that weak set happen to be deleted from elsewhere. So if they no longer exist outside of the context of that weak set or weak map, they are actually eligible for garbage collection. So the weak map and weak set do not block the garbage collection process like a traditional map or a traditional set would. There also is one caveat to note here, and that's that you can't actually iterate over the keys in a weak map. And the reason for this is that whether or not they exist depends on what the current state of garbage collection is. So for example, when we do object one equals null, this doesn't automatically garbage collect object one. It just tells the JavaScript engine like, hey, you can garbage collect this if you need to at some point. So because of that, we actually don't know if it's currently still in the weak map or not. JavaScript might have removed it or it might have not removed it yet. So because of that, we can't actually iterate over that weak map because it's going to be non-deterministic. It's going to depend on that state of the garbage collector. So because of that, it's just not allowed at all. Up next is actually two different features that are getting more popular, but I'm still seeing some people either misusing them or just not actually knowing that they exist at all. And that's going to be the nullish coalescing operator and optional chaining. So here we have a person object with a name and an address, which is just a city. And we log out person.address.city, which is Silicon Valley. But what would happen if say we had no city? Well, now we get undefined, which is fine. That's sort of expected behavior. But what if say we had no address or city? Well, now this throws an error because we do person.address, which is undefined. Then we do undefined.city and you can't do undefined.city because undefined is not an object. So what we can do instead is we can use optional chaining. So we can put a question mark before this dot, which essentially says, hey, if this thing before me was already undefined, just make the whole thing undefined. But if it wasn't undefined, keep going down this chain. So now if I run this, you can see we actually get undefined. So this allows us to just not error out if we try to go deeply down an object and we get to somewhere that doesn't actually exist. But of course, if I was to uncomment this out, then you can see we now have Silicon Valley once again. So this is optional chaining, but then we also have this idea of the nullish coalescing operator. So what if say we don't know if the city is going to exist, so we're still going to use optional chaining. However, we don't want undefined as the default value. So instead we can use two question marks after this entire value, which simply says, 
If this thing to the left of the question marks is nullish, meaning null or undefined, then use this value to the right of the question marks. So maybe we'll just have unknown city, and you can see we still get Silicon Valley, but if we were to remove our city, we now get this unknown city value because the value to the left of the nullish coalescing operator, so person.address question mark dot city was undefined. Next, I want to look at something known as freezing an object. So here we have a person object with a name and an age. And you can see we set the person's age to be 31. We add some city of New York. Then we delete the person's name. We log out person. And now we have age of 31 and city of New York with no name. But maybe we want to make this person actually be immutable. We have it as a constant, but all the constant says is that person as a variable cannot be reassigned, but we can still change the values in this object. The way we can change that is by using object.freeze, and this is going to take in some object and freeze this object, meaning say we cannot change it anymore. So if we run this, you can see we still have name is John and age is 30, so none of this actually did anything. And if we actually put this into strict mode, so if we were to say use strict, and then run this again, you'll see we actually end up getting a type error for trying to change the frozen object. Now, it is worth noting that if I was to remove this code, this is going to, of course, still work. And then if I was to have some deeply nested object, so let's say person.obj is just an empty object, and then we try to change that object. So if we said person.obj.a is going to be equal to abc, now we can log this out and you can see we still have this obj and it has a is abc. So this actually was able to change the object. So the top level object is frozen. However, these nested objects are not. So if we wanted to freeze that object as well, we'd have to come in here and say object.freeze person.obj. And this would actually freeze that object as well. And of course, if you do need this sort of deep freezing behavior like we're doing here, you could write a helper function for doing that. But just know the built-in object.freeze is just freezing the object at that top level. Next, I want to look at a little bit of a quirk with how integers and numbers in general work in JavaScript. So here we have this number, which happens to be the largest what's called safe number in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, we have our numbers, which are stored internally. And there's going to be a maximum of how many different numbers we can actually store, given how much space we actually have for them. So if I would try to add two to this number, you see we actually get the wrong result. So the last digit here is a one, so we're adding two. So that digit should become three. But here the digit is two. So this actually did not work. This addition is incorrect. And if I do any addition with numbers larger than two, we're likely to get incorrect answers. So if we do say plus 200, you can see again, we're getting an incorrect value. So how do we actually fix this? Well, we can use a different type known as a big int. There's a couple ways to create a big int, but the easiest is simply to add an n to the end of a number. And this is going to say, hey, this is an integer. There's no chance that this number is going to be a decimal and I need more space for it. So I need a larger maximum number. And now when I run this, you can see we actually get the correct answer. And you can see there is an n here to represent that this number here is a big int. It's worth noting also that you can't combine these. So I couldn't do num as a big int plus two because, oh, two is not a big int. We don't need it there. This actually would not work. It gives us a type error, cannot mix big int and other types use explicit conversions. So we do need to make sure we're using big ints with big ints. But if you ever need extremely large numbers in JavaScript, this is the type you likely want to use. Next, I want to look at something known as a generator function. So here we have a function called incrementing generator but it has this star here. So this says, hey, this is going to be a generator function, meaning it essentially returns a generator object to us. So here we have a value, which is zero, and we have a while true loop. And inside of this while true loop, we yield value plus plus. So essentially what this is, yield is like return, but it says, hey, return this value to wherever I was called from, but then just pause this function in case we need to come back later. So don't end the function, simply pause it. And then we can see we create a generator, which is by simply calling our incrementing generator function. And then we use generator.next, which is a function, and then we get dot value off of it. And this is going to log out zero. But if say we did this multiple times, you'll see we get zero, one, and then two. So essentially the first time we get into this loop, 
and we have value is zero, and then we increment it. And then the next time value is one, the next time after that value is two, and so on and so forth. Of course, we could do something else here. We could do, say, value plus equals two, and now we get two, four, and then six. And there's actually lots of other features of generators that I'm not going to go into in this video, where you can do things like passing values back into the generator. But for now, just know that this is sort of the basic idea of generators that you can have this function that every time you call it, it sort of just continues the previous execution that we had. And these do have a lot of different use cases, one being doing something like this, where say we need to create a new unique identifier for every single call. Now I want to take a look at a primitive type in JavaScript that I very rarely see used, and oftentimes a lot of people don't even know it exists, but it can be very useful, and that's called a symbol. So we create a symbol just like this. So for example, we have symbol one and symbol two, which are both equal to this call to symbol, and we pass in some identifier. And what's cool about a symbol is it always returns something unique. So if say we do console.log our symbol one, then we'll see we have our symbol and symbol two is the other symbol. And if we check is symbol one equal to symbol two, we will get false. And this is even true with loose equality. And it would even be true if we had the same identifier. So these are still not the same symbol. So these identifiers are just to make it easy when we're logging them out to know what they are, but they do not actually mean that they are the same. So this symbol function returns a new symbol every single time. And where this is particularly useful is with objects. So we can say we have some object and oftentimes with an object, we want to use symbols as our keys to guarantee that the key is going to be unique. So we could do something like our obj at symbol one is going to be equal to one, two, three, and maybe obj at our symbol two is going to be equal to four, five, six. And now, of course, if I was to log out our object, so we could do console log our obj, you'll see we get this object and it just logs out symbol identifier one, two, three, and symbol identifier four, five, six. And we could do something like our obj at symbol two, and this would log out four, five, six. You might be thinking, what is the point of this? But there's actually lots of times that we want to make sure that no matter what, our object keys are going to be unique. For example, maybe we got some object from some API and we need to add something of our own to that object. However, we need to make sure that there's no chance that we ever override some value that was given to us from that API. How can we do that? Well, we can use a symbol to make sure that our key is 100% unique and has no chance of overriding whatever was given to us from that API. And that's just one use case, but there are a lot of times where we just need these unique identifiers and symbols can be a great choice for that. Now I want to look at something known as a tagged template literal. So you've likely seen template literals before. So for example, here we have formatted, which is this template literal of the total price is and then price. But you can see we have this currency tag before it. And what this does is it calls this function here. So this is sort of a custom way to handle a template literal to say, hey, take whatever values we have here and pass them in to this function. So we have strings, which is going to be an array of any strings we have. So in this case, it would be the total price is with the space at the end, as well as the period from the end. And then we have our values, which is going to be any values that we have in here. So any values that are actual JavaScript values that we are going to be processing within our template literal. And usually the way that I tend to do this is by using a reduce. So strings dot reduce as sort of a way to combine all of the strings we have. And for each one, get the next value we have. So by using the current index, so this is going to be that next value. And in this case, all we're doing is saying if the type of the value is a number, then what we want to do is say, hey, that value, it's a currency, so we just want two decimal places. So value dot two fixed of two. So here you can see we have price is 19.5005, and that's going to format it to be the total price is 1950. Then you can see we have the period at the end as well. So there's lots of uses to these tagged template literals. You might have actually used them before not even knowing it because a lot of different frameworks and libraries actually rely on them. But regardless, I don't see a lot of people actually implementing their own and they can be useful for a lot of different things. So let me know what JavaScript features are a little bit unknown, but you love using and then watch this video next on some clean code principles that you should make sure to follow in your own code.